I've been working at the IET for quite a short time, but even with the short time that I've been working there, I mean, I've seen changes um, in terms of engagement um, around lifelong learning for engineers and technologists. Um, and we're actually addressing those changes at the IET by developing a brand new um, online and mobile uh, learning academy. Um, and I'll just take you through why actually we're, we're doing that and how that impacts um, the engineering and technology sectors in general. So, lifelong learning, um, it's a phrase that most of us have heard, but actually, what does it actually mean? Um, does it mean that I have to start learning at four and I can't finish until I'm 90? Um, but in the US, the National Academies of Engineering published a report called The Engineer of 2020 a couple of years ago. It highlighted that the engineer's career and the technologist's uh, career is, is changing massively. Engineers used to go on a very, very linear career structure, but the report highlighted that due to rapidly changing technology, an engineer's or a technologist's career is going to be much more fragmented, and therefore the need to learn new skills, to have new knowledge, whether that be technical or general, is going to be an imperative in order for an engineer to succeed in his or her career but also for employers to ensure that they actually get the best people working for them. Of course, training and development has always been there. We've all been on those courses where we sit in a room for five days or we sit in a lecture theatre answering our emails, um, surfing the internet, that kind of thing. And those still happen. Um, but actually, What's happened since really the recession hit um, a few years ago is that employers particularly are looking for something more worthwhile, something whereby they're not sending cohorts out for five days a week to a fancy hotel in central London. They're actually looking for different solutions. And today's presentation will actually look at a number of companies who have actually embraced that idea and are actually using it right now. So the learning and development market is still very large in the UK. It's estimated that in 2015, companies spent around three billion pounds in the UK on training their employees. And that's both on general and technical training. Um, but what's happening in the market, it's becoming highly fragmented. I think if we look at the university sector, the universities themselves are actually not just offering traditional degrees like they used to do, whether that be undergraduate or postgraduate, but many, many universities are offering short CPD courses. Many universities are actually looking at the structure of their MBA programs, for instance, and saying, well, actually, we're not getting the throughput that we used to get, whereby a company will invest £100,000 in sending their star employee <coughs> on an MBA program. So universities are actually looking at developing very, very tailored um, programs and actually going out to specific industry sectors um, to actually try and sell those programs to them. Training companies always existed, whether they be um, independent or whether they be part of larger corporations. And they're actually changing their business model as well. They're moving away from that traditional, we'll come in and deliver a course to 200 of your employees, which tomorrow will go and deliver the same course to another company just down the road with the same content. Those training companies are actually looking at tailoring their courses to specific companies now because they have to. And more interestingly, professional engineering institutions as well are changing their model and we at the IET are doing just that. Um, the mechanical engineers are doing it. Um, the civil engineers are doing it. And I'll show you how the marine engineers are also doing it a bit later on. And more interestingly there, we're all coming together to think about how we can work together to deliver lifelong education to the engineering and technology sectors. And of course, I've mentioned this a little bit, but L&D can take a number of different forms. And this is kind of the traditional model, I think, that, that everybody would recognise around learning opportunities for the engineer or technologist, whereby the employer there at the top right sponsors you to go off to university or sponsors you to get a degree, um, where the employer offers in-house training courses. Um, 
the employer sends you off to a conference in San Diego for a week and you come back and they say, well, what did you get out of it? And it was like, well, it was great. I met all my friends. Um, we all had a drink in the bar and we went to, down to the beach. And, but what did you get out of it? What are you going to bring back? Mm, not so much. Um, and then the best one, the one, the holy grail really, where the employee pays for it all themselves out of their pocket. Um, where you can persuade them to pay £1,500 to go on a course which may benefit or it may not benefit them. But, you know, that exists in some sectors. We did some research around learning and development, and on average, the engineer, a uh, typical engineer, he or she will spend around £750 a year on CPD or lifelong learning, most of which is paid for by the employer there's minimum spend coming from the individual themselves, apart from things like subscriptions to a PEI, uh, because still retaining their membership. And thinking of is lifelong learning for me as an individual. Well, we do a couple of surveys every year at the IET. One is out to our members. We now have 165,000 members globally. Um, and then we also go out to industry where we do our skills and demand and industry survey. And when we ask members what was the most important thing for them um, by being a member of the IET, obviously professional registration, becoming ING or CENG um, is really important. But the next thing was professional development and training. We want to look to you as our member organization to deliver training for us in order for us to progress our career. We just don't want it to stop at professional registration. Also, 50% of our members intend to improve their professional or technical skills in the next year. Now, you can imagine where that demographic sits. It doesn't sit with our retired members or our nearing retired members, but it sits with our younger members. And actually, when we dig into why our younger members join the IET, it's because they want us to train them. They want us to give them education. And that's true, actually. Um, my previous company, we, we published on behalf of something like 1,200 societies globally. And the only reason millennials, as we call them, joined a society was for education. They don't care about the journal, they don't care about the magazine, they really don't care about the diary. But actually, what they want is education. And then interestingly, when we went out to engineering employers, they report that the skills gaps that exist for new recruits, i.e. those coming straight out of university, they're really not job ready. Engineering wise, they're fine but it's the multidisciplinary skills. It's how do I interact with the marketing department? How do I think about managing a team? How do I talk to the sales guys over there? Those skills aren't existing. Or I can do project management in the general sense, but actually, can you go and do project management on a rig in the North Sea? Mm. Not so much. And obviously, lifelong learning comes down to continuing professional development as well. And I think many of you will be aware that the Engineering Council gathered together all of the PEIs back in 2012 and asked them about the take-up of CPD within engineering. And what they found was that compared to other sectors such as medicine, law, nursing, engineers were really falling behind in terms of CPD and the take-up of CPD. And so what the Engineering Council has now said is that, okay, we really want to encourage engineers and technologists to actually do more CPD, to ensure that they're job ready, to ensure that they're competitive in the international market. And in order to do that, what they're saying is that we will audit your CPD. Voluntarily sign up to be audited, but we will audit your CPD. And so we, as professional institutions, need to ensure that we're offering the most flexible way for any engineer or technologist to learn, to gain the CPD points, to record those CPD points. And this is what is inspiring the growth in digital learning. Basically, 
We need to support our members globally. The easiest way for us to do that is to provide some kind of digital learning opportunity. And just to break things up a bit, um, I will just play you a quick video which is actually just showing the type of thing that we at the IET, if I can find said video, are actually doing. CPD, your professional journey. Learn the easy way to complete your 30 hours of CPD per year. Continuing professional development, CPD, refers to the maintenance and development of knowledge and skills relevant to ensuring you remain competent as a professional engineer or technician. It's how you keep up to date with current practice. It drives you to improve your skills and progress into new roles and helps keep you employable throughout your working life. CPD begins right at the start of your career and continues thereafter. In 2013, the Engineering Council announced an aspiration that by January 2017, all professional engineering institutions will have introduced a policy of random reviewing of professionally active registrants' CPD returns. The IET's Board of Trustees have agreed that we meet this aspiration, extending it as a benefit to these categories of membership, TMIET, MIET, FIET. However, there's nothing to stop other classes of membership such as students and associates from engaging with the CPD scheme. It's just that they won't be subject to annual review. We recommend a minimum of 30 hours. So what we're trying to do there is obviously show to our members the benefits of lifelong learning. So we grab them young. And as you continue your, through your career, we at the IET will support you. And it's not just the IET, all of the other um, engineering institutions are actually doing very, very similar schemes. So the landscape itself is also changing. Now this is the results of a survey done by the Learning and Performance Institute in 2015. And they went out to L&D directors and says, okay, what type of courses are you going to be offering um, your employees um, this year um, and what are you going to do next year and as you can see the blended learning piece at the top so the blend between face-to-face -face and technology is actually starting to increase quite rapidly and what they're saying is down at the bottom we want to reduce those formal face-to-face -face courses and again that's to do with time out of the office that's to do with cost that's to do with having people in a hotel um, for three or four days. Um, but what's interesting as well is internet-based learning. Um, the increased or perceived increase of massive online open courses, um, which is an interesting model. Um, they were introduced about three or four years ago um, by the likes of edX and Coursera over in the US. And obviously we, we have MOOCs that are also uh, based here in the UK. Um, and it was all free, it was great. The education was free, the interaction was free, the certification at the end was free. But interestingly, this year, particularly Coursera, have started charging for the certificate of completion. So it's gone from being that completely free model to actually, ooh, we could make some money out of this. And it's not cheap to get a certificate from Coursera. Actually, it can be up to $250 for completion. Not saying it's not that MOOCs are a bad thing, but it's interesting to see how that model's changing from a completely free model to actually, we need to make some money to be able to continue this. So the e-learning market size, and so when we talk about e-learning, we think about that blend as well, that blend of in-person and online and mobile. Apparently it's gonna be worth $51.5 billion by the end of 2016 and a growth rate of 8%, um, which actually, if you think of today's economy, I mean, that's quite an impressive growth rate. Um, and that 51.5 billion is spent on a wide range of things. Um, the e-learning market itself is quite buoyant in terms of acquisition. Um, e-learning companies are being bought up by other e-learning companies, by other big corporates, left, right, and center. Um, and so the value of the market may be a bit inflated, actually. Yeah. <clears throat> is, that, is that 
that the engineering and technology? That's, that's global. Yeah, that's global excluding education, so excluding K-12 through education, uh, which is, is counted as... But that's the market that, that we're talking about today. It's massive. Um, interestingly as well, a lot of that spend by corporates and SMEs goes on buying or licensing a learning management system or a VLE. And then they license it and think, well, that was nice. We've got a really nice learning management system in-house now, but we've got no content. What can we put on it? So therefore, the costs tend to increase in spiral. Um, and so we'll just look at a couple of case studies in a bit to show how those costs can be um, spread more a bit evenly. Um, however, I think one thing that's important here is when we're talking about the e-learning market is to really think about that blend. What we're not saying is that face-to-face -face interaction is going to go away. It's not. But what you can actually do with technology now in terms of creating chat rooms about a learning event, in terms of networking on a learning management system, are becoming more and more important. But I really, even as a technologist, don't think that face-to-face -face will actually go away completely. Because at the end of the day, we're all human and we like interaction. But it won't be a five-day course. It'll be a half day. It'll be a day. It'll be an evening where you actually interact. So one of the interesting case studies that, that's, that's actually happening right now is the building research establishment and the development of their academy. Um, they've obviously been in the news in the past week about the zero-cost house uh, that, you can, that they're developing. Um, but they've got a really interesting model in terms of the academy itself. Um, it was established in March 2014 as a face-to-face -face academy. But what happened is at launch there, um, it was just following the recession and people weren't prepared to come out and do the five-to-day face-to-face training. And so they really flipped that model on its head and they said, okay, let's think about doing it as an e-learning enterprise. Um, and so what they now offer is e-learning in the main around their education, but also the bespoke client training piece. So we will come out to you. We will have some network interaction. We will actually allow people to meet face to face. Now, what they've done is they've created programs that are certification led and they've worked with academic partners to create those programs to allow the certification. And they're offered at level three and above. So, so really pre-undergraduate running right through postgraduate. Um, so a really wide range to actually engage the vast majority of people in the organizations that they're working with. And what they're saying is that the success, and I think this is the theme now that you'll see running through uh, the next few pieces, is collaboration, not just working in isolation, but actually opening it up and saying, we can't do this alone anymore. We can't be that arrogant. Actually, we need, in order to offer the best education we can, to work in partnership with other people. And another interesting uh, case study is um, the Marine Learning Alliance, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of the Institute of Marine Engineering, Science and Technology. Um, it's a small business but it's technology driven. And they've partnered with Plymouth University to offer a wide range of blended courses, including degree level qualifications. And so again, as a PEI, IMRS couldn't actually offer a degree level qualification themselves. And so they partnered with Plymouth. And so together, they can actually market out um, specific um, degree level courses which are relevant to their own market. They also offer an e-only option. Um, and what's great here about this is that due to the mobile working nature of the cohort who they serve, they're the first PEI to actually develop a mobile application. And that mobile application, actually it's great, you can download it um, from the App Store and you can actually see some content on there. But that mobile application contains all of the e-learning courses on there. Um, and contains all of the assessments as well. Um, and so actually, as a CPD tool, as a lifelong learning tool, 
It's a really great tool actually for an engineer who's out and about doing their job. And the final case study here is, is from the Atlas Knowledge Group, who are a solutions provider for safety critical industries. Um, it was only founded in 1995, but it already operates in 102 countries. Uh, it's got 600 clients and actually 500,000 active users on this platform. And the vast majority of the courses they offer are online only. They do offer some blended events, but it's online only. And I think what's interesting here is the model that they actually offer. So they've changed from just being that training company I mentioned earlier, whereas we'll offer you that course and that's the only course that we offer. What they've actually done, they've actually created an educational solutions business as well as a content business. And so what they actually say to their clients is that here's the online course, but actually our internal team at Atlas will actually work with you to develop it specifically for you and your employees. And what they've done is that they've actually employed real educational technology experts to do that. So it's not just a training company, it's not just about L&D, but it's also about technology. And that technology is movable, so you don't have to just learn on the Atlas platform. But what they're actually saying as well is that you can just license the content, put it on your own platform. And whether that's for security reasons, or whether or not you've invested in a learning management system and you haven't got anything on it, but, but what they're saying is that the model is so much more flexible than it's ever been before. And I think that's what we're seeing with the lifelong learning market, is the increased flexibility. So, what are we and the other PEIs trying to do? Well, we're now working in partnership. So we work in partnership with the civils, the mechanicals, the marines, to actually think about what is appropriate for the engineering and technology sectors for lifelong learning and CPD. Quality content is key. As we all know, there's so much content on the internet right now. I can go and search for something and it's there. But actually, is it quality? Probably not. Um, so actually, we're working with academic partners. We're working with corporate partners to create content that's appropriate for the marketplace. Also, flexibility in purchasing. We can't just say, everything's 50 pounds, that's it, thanks very much. But actually, freemium, try before you buy. We'll offer you a per hour price, whether or not you are a corporate, whether or not you're an individual. And also per qualification as well, because we're working with academic partners, we can actually offer you a qualification price. And these qualifications are what we're developing right now. Also, it's really important that we engage with the employers. What we're finding is that with employers, the people who hold the purse strings aren't the influencers. The director of engineering, the director of technology is the influencer. But then we have to go to the L&D director to actually say, can we have some money? Because the engineering director wants this. So we really do have to think about how we engage more with employers. Also, supporting the learner is really, really important. We can't just say, every Thursday between 5 and 6 p.m., you will come on to the IET's LMS and you will receive your learning. Well, that's not how anybody works anymore, I don't think. So basically, we have to offer anytime, anywhere learning opportunities. And whether that be via a laptop, PC, or whether that be by your mobile or tablet device, that has to be what we develop and deliver going forward. Self-directed learning as well. Let's do an assessment before you take the learning. There's 15 hours of learning. Actually, you only need to do the last five because of the knowledge and skills that you already have. And also, lifelong learning isn't just about content, it isn't just about taking a test. Being a mentor can actually deliver lifelong learning opportunities for you as an individual and also for others. Social interaction important, whether that be via technology or whether that be in person, so the blended events I've talked about. And also, certification, and certificates of completion. Two totally different things, which I don't want to get into in terms of debate right now, but um, actually, what's in it for me at the end? Can I say I've completed this? Can I put it in my e-portfolio? Can I show a future employer? Can I show my current boss to say, I've done this, give me a pay rise? Um, that's really important as well. So f where are we going next with lifelong learning? Where are we going next with um, CPD? Well, adaptive 
online lifelong learning is something that's coming on board right now. What I mean by adaptive, what type of content is appropriate for me as an individual, not just the 30 people who are in my department. So also adaptive assessments. Which assessments are best for me? Is it multiple choice? Is it watching a video and answering some questions? Also fully adaptive courses as well. So whether that be courses that are adapted by, say, the IET for an individual client, or actually courses that adapt to me as an individual as I work through them. That's happening right now in higher education, and that's going to actually start transforming the way that lifelong learning and CPD works going in the future. Collaboration again. I'll say it again. That is so important for us. We know that we can't do this alone. We need to collaborate with academics, PEIs, industry to actually get this right. And at the end of the day, what we want to do is give engineers and technologists working in the market right now increased skills, increased knowledge, so that they are successful both in their careers, but also that they compete in the international market as well. Thanks.